17 days ago, before Christmas break, we talked about wave behavior at boundaries. In other words, what happens to a wave when it encounters a boundary between two materials, or we say two different media? Well, there's two things that can happen when that wave encounters that boundary. In fact, two things that will happen when the wave encounters that boundary. One of them you see up on the board right now, reflection can happen. What's the other thing that can happen? It's not up there right now. Reflection and transmission. You will always get some of both. Some of the wave will reflect, always. Some of the wave will transmit, always. Now, how much transmits and how much reflects depends upon the materials. If the materials are very similar, you get mostly transmission. If the materials are very different, then you get mostly reflection. You're always going to get some of both, but sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes it's mostly reflection, and sometimes it's mostly transmission, depending upon the materials involved. All right, let's take a look at the reflected wave, the part of the wave that doesn't get transmitted, the part of the wave that bounces back. Sometimes that wave will be reflected right side up on the same side as it went down on. Remember the demonstration we did just before the break? We sent a wave down, and I can't remember who our volunteer was at the other end of the slinky. Somebody was holding onto the slinky, and when we sent that wave down and it reflected off of that person's hand, do you remember that it reflected? Was it right side up or upside down? It was upside down. So when it encountered a medium that was more dense, when it went from less dense to more dense, it was reflected upside down. Now, usually when we're talking about uh, a wave that's going from a less dense medium to a more dense medium, it means that we've got something attached there. The slinky was attached to the person's hand. Then we went out into the atrium and we dangled the slinky down over the uh, bridge in the atrium. And the slinky wasn't attached to anything. We had a slinky, a wave that was going through the slinky and then reflecting off of the slinky air boundary. It was going from more dense to less dense and it was going um, to a medium that it wasn't, or trying to go to a medium that it wasn't attached to. And that was reflected right side up. Side up. You remember, we sent it down on the side of the library, and it came back up on the side of the library. So it's reflected upright or right side up when it's going from more dense to less dense. And when it's not attached. You guys remember that? Think of the demonstration, okay? Um, listen, there's so much, so many little things to remember in physics. Less things to remember in physics probably than there is in something like social class or, or something like that. But there's still a lot of little things to remember. And if you're anything like me, not very good at remembering those little things. Okay? Um, if we've seen it, physically seen it with our own eyes happen, okay, then think of that. Okay, remember that. We're more likely to remember it, um, I think, if we remember the demonstration, then if we just simply try to memorize something, okay? Think about when the slinky wave went down and it reflected off of the person's hand, which side did it come back on? Think about the demonstration out there in the atrium when it went back and reflected off of the, the slinky air boundary, which side did it come back on? All right, the law of reflection occurs when we have a boundary and the wave reflects off of that boundary but it's striking it at an angle. Let's say that it comes up like this. Um, what does the law of reflection tell us? If the wave is striking the boundary at an angle like this, it's going to bounce off at the same angle. We always measure that angle from a line right here, this dotted line right here. So this is going to be, we'll call it theta i, the angle of incidence. We'll call this one theta r, the angle of reflection. Theta i is going to be equal to theta r. What do we call that dotted line there? What do we normally call that dotted line there? The normal line. Okay, normal in physics means 90 degrees, and that's a line that's drawn 90 degrees to the boundary. 
And so therefore we call that the normal line. We always measure the angle of incidence and angle of reflection from the normal line. All right, now let's look at the part of the wave that's, that's transmitted. Can't really see this in the demonstration, but we talked about it a little bit. Okay, the part of the wave that's transmitted has some properties that change and some properties that stay the same. You guys remember what changed? The speed changed. Fundamentally, the speed changed. Speed either went up or it went down. When a slinky wave goes to a person, you can't see the speed of the wave and how it's affected, but we do know that the speed of the wave is either going to go up or go down. What else changes because of the speed? I'm going to circle that one because that's, that's the most important one right there. Okay, what else changes because of the speed? As the speed goes up, this goes up as well. Yep. Lambda goes up as well, right? Speed and lambda are directly related to each other. V is equal to F times lambda. As V goes up, lambda goes up. What else might also change? Doesn't always. Depends upon how the wave goes into the new medium. Sometimes, I'm going to put a little star by this one, sometimes the angle changes as well. If the wave goes in straight on at zero degrees measured from the normal line, then the angle will stay zero degrees. It's not going to change. But if it goes in at an angle, something other than zero degrees, then the angle is going to change. The direction of the wave is going to change. It all changes because of the speed. Okay, that's the big one. If the speed changes, then because of that, the wavelength changes and the angle changes. One thing stays the same. Once a wave has been made, this property never changes. Yep. The frequency never changes. Good. I'm going to draw a little picture for you to, uh, to, to illustrate, to give you an analogy to kind of illustrate what's going on here. Uh, the wavelength changing, the, the angle changing, the frequency staying the same, all as a result of the speed changing when you go from one medium to the other. This is an analogy. It's not really what's happening because we're we're, the analogy is not going to use waves, but it's going to, again, show you the relationship between those variables. Let's say, we got, let's say we got a boundary there between two materials. Our materials will be, let's say, pavement. And over here, we got a swamp. So it's this new shopping center or something with that's it's kind of built right beside a swamp. And here's our new parking lot, beautifully paved, nice and smooth. Okay, it's the kind of pavement that you want to take your, uh, you know, your skateboard out on or, or whatever. So here's your parking lot. Here's your swamp. And I, I don't know why you'd have this, but let's say, I don't know, maybe it's part of the opening of this new shopping center. We got a bunch of soldiers, and these soldiers are marching in a parade. And this is uh, looking at the soldiers from above. One, two, three, four, five, six soldiers looking at them from above. And if we draw a line that kind of connects those soldiers together, we're going to use that to represent our wave front. It's not really a wave, remember. It's, it's particles. It's people. But it's going to represent a wave front. And so you're looking at uh, an ocean wave from above. You kind of see a line that represents the crest of the ocean wave. Well, here we've got a, a line that is that represents the soldiers, the line of the soldiers. Okay, these soldiers are, are walking. They're walking forwards. But they all walk together because that's what soldiers do, right? They march in stride like this. And as they do that, of course, because they march in stride, they're all marching at the same speed. Going up like this, except this guy. This guy isn't marching at the same speed. How come? How come the guy, or the girl, I should say, at the end, isn't marching in stride with the other soldiers? He's in the swamp. What happens when this guy is trying to walk through 50 centimeters of swampy water? He doesn't go as fast, right? He's trying to keep up with these other five soldiers, but he can't go as fast through 50 centimeters of water. So he slows down a little bit right there. Now we're going to draw a line that joins all these soldiers together. Oh, look, this guy is down here. Okay, let's look forward in 
couple seconds later when the soldiers are are marching a little bit f further in the parking lot here. Soldier number one, number two, number three, number four. Oh, look at that. Number five is now in the swamp as well. He's going slower as well. Six, oh, he's still in the swamp, so he's still going slow. Join them together. We'll go what we got. A few seconds later, here's the soldiers again. Soldier number one and two are still on the pavement. They're walking fast. All the other guys are, are in the swamp. They have slowed down. Okay, I want you to notice a couple of things that have happened here. Okay, number one, you can see that the soldiers in the swamp have all slowed down, right? V has changed. The speed has decreased, correct? Speed has changed. But what else has changed? Look, this is the way the soldiers, this is the way the wave front was. The wave front was going this way. Look at which way the wave front is going now. So V has changed, but theta has changed as well. The direction has changed because the speed has changed. What else has changed? What's this distance right here? What would we call that distance right there? What term is that? It's lambda. Look at lambda over here. What's, what else has changed? Lambda. So because the speed has gone down, the angle has gone down, and theta have gone, has gone down as well. What hasn't changed? Look, one, two, three waves in a certain amount of time. One, two, three waves in a certain amount of time. What hasn't changed? The frequency. So these things change. Frequency doesn't change. Once a wave has been made, the frequency stays the same. Does that make sense? This, by the way, is called, and we'll deal with this in a lot more detail next year, it's called refraction. It's called refraction when the speed of a wave changes, and because of the speed changing, the wavelength changes, the direction changes, but the frequency still stays the same. Today, I want to cover some new material now. Uh, firstly, starting off with uh, interference of waves. What happens when a wave encounters another wave, what does it look like? All right, you saw the demonstration that showed you when you get constructive interference, when you get destructive interference. I got two crests here now. Hey, I get, it doesn't matter which way they're going, but let's assume that maybe this guy is going this way and this guy is going this way, although it doesn't really matter. The directions are relevant. What matters is uh, the positions of the waves at that moment in time. What kind of interference do you think you're going to get here? We're going to get constructive interference, right? Because we got two crests. Now let's figure out exactly what the pattern is going to look like. Now this gives people a little bit of trouble sometimes. It doesn't need to though, because all it involves is counting and adding. And when I say adding, I don't mean adding crazy numbers like, you know, 17,122.9174 plus uh, 16,158.38492. Okay, I mean adding things like three plus one. Or it gets really hard sometimes, three plus negative one. What's three plus one? Mary, what's three plus one? Okay, I asked, I asked Mary that because Mary's really smart and I knew she'd know the answer to that question. Mallory, what's three plus negative one? Mallory, three plus negative one. Two. Good, good. Um, um, you guys have got a handout right now that looks exactly like this. What I want to go through now is um, is the process of figuring out what the wave looks like as a result of these two crests interfering with each other. The constructive interference pattern that we use. We call it the superposition principle, and it involves um, looking at various spots along the two waves and literally just adding um, the positions of those waves, the vertical positions of those waves. So I've got it superimposed over graph paper for you, and the reason that I've done that the reason that I've superimposed it over graph paper is so that we can so we don't have to use a ruler to measure how high above uh, the the axis the wave is or how high below the axis the wave is. We can simply just count blocks. So what I want to do is start um, 
what I want to do is look at the part of the wave that uh, that uh, cross over each other or that um, that um, overlap with each other. So that's going to be from uh, this position to this position. See what I'm doing there? Okay, right now I'm ignoring over here. I'm ignoring over here because they're not encountering each other right now. Now they will. Okay, if these waves are moving and they've got to be moving, then they're going to encounter each other, but they're not encountering each other right now. So focus on the part where they are encountering each other, where they're overlapping. Do that. We have to look at this in a moment, but we're going to save that to last because that's really, really, really easy. We're going to look at the part that's hardest first, and that's the part where they overlap. So I want to look at every vertical line here, every vertical grid line on my graph paper, and then I want to count how many blocks above or below the axis each of these waves are. So we'll call this guy wave number one. We'll call this guy wave number two. Okay, at this vertical line right here, okay, this vertical line right here, let's number these actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's call this wave A actually, it's just so we don't get mixed up between numbers and letters. This one's gonna be wave B. At vertical line number one, Wave A is two blocks above. You see that? Okay. One block, two blocks. Wave A is two blocks above. Wave B is one block above. Mary, what's two plus one? Look at that. Two plus one is three. So we're going to put a little X at three. Wave A is two above. Wave B is one above. Two plus one is three. So we put a little red X at three blocks above. Now, at position two... Wave A is how many blocks above? Two. Wave B is how many blocks above? Two. Two plus two is four. So we're going to put a little X at four blocks above. At position three, wave A is how many blocks above? Logan, how many blocks above is it? Wave A? Two, yeah. Wave B is about two and a half. Looks to be about two and a half there, right? Two plus two and a half is hardest one yet. Four and a half. So we're going to go four and a half above. Put a little X right there, four and a half above. At position four, wave A is, uh, it's about two above. It's a little bit below that, but we don't have to be perfect on this. It's not an exact science here. It's about two, let's say. Wave B is about three. Two plus three is what, Kelly? Five. So we're going to make, we're going to put our X at about five. At position five, uh, wave A is uh, 1.75, about one and three quarters. About, it doesn't have to be perfect, remember. Just a, about one and three quarters. Wave B looks to be, Pretty close to three. So what do we got? One and seven, one point seven five plus three is about four point seven five. Listen, if you're off by a little bit, that's okay. Now, if you put it way down here, that's not okay. Okay. If I make it at four point six as opposed to four point seven five, okay, you're not going to lose any marks for that. So we're about right there. What about position six? Uh, what do we got here? Wave A looks to be about, what does that look like to you? Um, Shay, what does that look like to you? Wave wave A at position six, about one, sorry, one and a half. Yeah, probably about one and a half, I'd say. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Wave B looks to be about three and a bit, 3.2, 3.25. Sure, one and a half plus 3.25 is about 4.75. About the same place, roughly. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Wave seven. Uh, sorry, yeah, position seven. We're just a bit above one. 1.1, 1 1.2, something like that. Wave B is three point bit. So we got one and a bit plus three and a bit. Gives me four and a bit. Maybe four and a half, four point something. Somewhere in that range, right? 
And if we're using a ruler to measure this, how much above each wave was, and we can we'd be exact here, but it doesn't, we don't, we don't need to be exact. We just want to get the general, the gist of it. Uh, at position eight, we've got, I don't know, but it looks like about 0.5 right here. Three and a bit. So that's going to be what, 3.75, something like that? Just under four. Oops, don't want to erase that. Now I'm going to get rid of all this extra stuff. You don't have to erase all this extra stuff. I'm just doing it to just to declutter it a little bit. Now that I've looked at the overlapping portion, counted how far above, measured how far above or below the axis each wave was and added them together, now i got to look at the parts that don't overlap. But the good news is the parts that don't overlap are really, really easy. What am I doing there? Just tracing it, right? Because there's nothing to add to it. And over here, there's nothing to add to it either. At this moment in time, now keep in mind that this is one instant in time. The pattern's going to change one-tenth of a second later. But at this instant in time, at this moment in time, you wouldn't see those two waves. You would see this one wave that looked like this you would see a bigger wave. In the re and because it's a bigger wave, we call it constructive interference. Now, the same thing would happen if you flip this over, right? If you turn your head upside down right now and look at this upside down, then it looks like we have two troughs two troughs that looked like this would produce the same pattern, except it would be upside down as well. We'd still call that destructive, or sorry, constructive interference. Some people think it's destructive interference when we have two troughs. It's not, because you're still building a bigger wave. When you're digging a hole, you're constructing a hole. It's not destroying anything. Okay, destroying is canceling something out. You've built something and then you take it down. When you dig a hole, as the hole gets deeper, you're constructing a hole. It's constructive interference when you have two troughs as well as two crests. Okay, let's take a look at the second diagram. I want to see if you guys can do this one yourself, though, okay? Keep in mind, keep in mind, though, that when we have a crest up here and a trough down here, the trough is below. So this is where we got to start adding negative numbers, right, Mallory? We got, you know, say two above right here, and we've got two and a half below right here. What's two plus negative 2.5? It's going to be negative 0.5, and our x would go somewhere in here, right? Make sense? Now, remember, look at the part that overlaps first. Look at the part that overlaps first, and then worry about over here and over here. Those are the easy parts. Okay, let's see what we can do with that, and then we'll take a look at it as a group. All right, let's have a look at this now. Um, we want to look at, at uh, this area right here. Let's call this position one, position two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight. Look at the first eight positions because those are the positions where the waves are overlapping, and that's where they're going to interfere, produce either a bigger wave or a smaller wave. What do you think we're going to get here? Bigger wave or smaller wave? Smaller wave, and if we get a smaller wave, we call it constructive or destructive interference. Destructive interference. Now, um, we don't know that necessarily we're going to get complete destructive interference. They may not completely cancel each other out. Okay, they would if they were exactly the same wave um, right above and right below each other. Okay, we're probably going to get partial destructive interference here, but I, th I do think it is going to be destructive interference here. Let's look at position one. Okay, position one, let's call it wave A and wave B again. At position one, wave A is two above. Wave B is a little bit more than one below. Two plus negative one is one. It's actually two plus negative 1.2, so it's a little bit below one right here. Uh, position two, we got two above and we've got two below. Two plus negative two is what? Zero. So the wave is going to be at that position at that moment in time. 
Uh, position three, we got two above, and it looks like about two and a half below. Two plus negative 2.5 gives me negative 0.5. So I'm going to put my little X down here. Um, that's about two. It's a little bit below two, but it's it's pretty close. Say two plus negative three gives me two plus negative three gives me negative one. So it's going to be about right here. What is that? About one and a half. A little bit more than one and a half. Say three point two ish. Um, say one point six. Plus negative 3.2 gives me about negative 1.5, negative 1.6, somewhere in that range. That's almost exactly one and a half. 1.5 plus, I don't know, we'll say 3.5. It makes the math easier. Gives me negative 2. 1 and negative 3.5 gives me about negative 2.5-ish. And then finally, position eight, we're at about 0.5, subtract 3.5 is about 0 0.5 plus negative 3.5 is negative three. All right, we did the hard part. Now let's do the easy part here, where the waves don't overlap. We got wave here, here, here. Easy, right? Just trace it over. Same deal over here. Just trace it. I mean, really, we're doing the same thing, I guess, except we don't have to add anything to it. So 3 plus 0 is 0. Now let's trace this over. What kind of interference is that? Yeah, it's destructive interference because we're definitely making a smaller wave than what we started off with. Destructive interference. So your unit test is next Monday. Next uh, mon Monday. And you will get one of these on your unit test next Monday. Okay, either constructive, destructive interference, something like this. Where you just gotta, you just gotta go through it, look at where they overlap. Okay, add them up where they overlap, and then trace the trace the entire thing just like this. Easy three out of three, right? Easy three out of three. Okay, on that test, or sorry, on that question on the test as well. Um, in addition to having to draw it out like we just have, you also have to tell me whether it's constructive or destructive interference. But that's not hard either, right? If it's bigger, it's constructive interference. If it's smaller, in other words, if the wave ends up being somewhere in between, then it's going to be destructive interference. Got it? All right, I want to show you one more thing here. This is going to relate to the the uh, second handout that you have, this the one with all the circles on it here. Uh, and this is going to relate to interference, but it's also going to relate to uh, uh, a, a phenomenon called diffraction. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave. We said refraction, uh, we said more or less, we defined it as the bending of a wave. Remember when, when a wave changes speed, when it goes into a new medium, it changes wavelength and sometimes changes direction. That's refraction. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave. So let's say, let's say we've got a, a, an opening here, a barrier, and an opening in that barrier that looks like this. So we've got a, I don't know, a concrete wall or something, and we've got water waves like this, coming towards that opening. Now, most of that water wave is just going to hit that barrier and reflect, but some of it's going to go through that barrier, right through the opening in that barrier. The part that goes through is going to go something like this, right? The part that goes through won't change direction. It won't speed up or slow down. It won't change wavelength, but it will spread out at the edges. Something like this. That's why if you yell down the hallway, somebody around the corner can hear you because the sound wave spreads out. It diffracts around the corner or through an opening. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave through an opening or around a barrier. 
Now, sometimes it diffracts a lot. Sometimes it spreads out a lot. Sometimes it spreads out only just a little bit. And there's a couple of factors that affect how much it spreads out. We say sometimes the angle of spread. Okay? This would be a relatively small angle of spread. But if it's spread out like this, then that would be a bigger angle of spread. Okay, more diffraction is taking place. Okay, so the angle of spread or the amount of diffraction is affected by a couple of factors, a couple of variables. The first thing that affects it is the size of the opening. If you have a smaller opening, in other words, if the size of the opening goes down, then the amount of diffraction or the angle of spread will go up. You make that hole smaller where the waves are going through, it's going to spread out more. The frequency of the wave also affects it. As the frequency goes down, the amount of diffraction goes up, or the angle of spread, we could say, increases. It spreads out more if the frequency is small. And wavelength is exactly the opposite of frequency. As frequency goes up, wavelength goes down, and vice versa. So as wavelength goes down, then the amount of diffraction will go, what do you want to predict here? Frequency and wavelength are inversely related to each other, right? As frequency goes down, diffraction goes up. As wavelength goes down, diffraction goes, Kessler? Diffraction goes down. That's what you meant to say, right? Yeah. When I was your age and I was learning this stuff for the first time, I could never remember this. Never. I remember this one. For whatever reason, I could, I could remember this. If the, as the opening gets smaller, we get more diffraction taking place. But I could never remember the relationship between frequency. If I could, then wavelength would be easy because it's just exactly the opposite. But I could never remember frequency. I'd get it right half the time because basically I could, in my head, flip a coin and I'd be right 50% of the time. Even as I went through university, I'd still always forget that. How does the frequency affect diffraction? And then one day in my first year teaching here, a light bulb went off and I figured out how to remember how frequency affects diffraction. Uh, when I moved here, I lived in an apartment, in a cheap apartment, um, at the bottom of the hill, just below Okotoks Junior High School, this big brown building, made just uh, behind the courthouse, um, underneath Okotoks Junior High School, underneath OJ. And I remember in my apartment, when I was young and single, going to bed in my apartment, listening to the radio. That's always how I'd fall asleep, is listening to the radio. And I'd listen to this one call-in show. It was kind of kind of silly and people that would call in or like, you know, sometimes you'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, are, like are some people really this screwed up? Like, like, I, but I, I'd listen to this, this call in show. Cause it, I don't know, it was entertaining and would put me to sleep. So that's, that's always how I'd fall asleep every night. And he was lying in bed, listen to this call in show on the radio and, uh, and, uh, and fall asleep that way. I'd set the timer on my radio and it would turn off in an hour and I'd be long asleep before the arrow was up. It was on AM radio. I don't remember what station it was, but it was on AM radio. And I remember that, you know, I, every night I listened to it. And then one night I turned on the radio to go to sleep so that I could fall asleep to this radio show and it wasn't on. My radio show wasn't on, it was something else. I'm like, well, how am I gonna fall asleep now? So I start flipping around and I can't, I can't find this radio show anywhere. 
like, oh man, like, and I don't know, it might have been a week later. I was uh, over at school, which, which Holy Trinity used to be JP2. So I'm over here at, at JP2, which was Holy Trinity. And I'm on my way home. I'm driving home and I'm flipping through FM radio stations. And all of a sudden I hear my radio show. It's late at night. I hear my radio show on, on my radio as I'm driving home from school at 1030 or whatever it was at night. I'm like, perfect. This is great. I found it. They just switched stations. That's all. So I go home and I go to tune my radio from AM whatever to FM whatever. And I think, wait a second. I can't even get FM radio. I can't get FM radio in my apartment at the bottom of the hill. So I couldn't hear my radio show. And then it wasn't at that moment that it occurred to me, but it was shortly thereafter that it occurred to me. Wait a second. This is how I can remember how frequency affects diffraction. Okay, if I have a wave, if I have a wave that has a low frequency, like AM, you ever look at a radio dial, it'll say AM is kilohertz, FM is megahertz, kilo means thousands, mega means millions. AM is low frequency, FM is high frequency. So if we have AM, we'll say AM is represented by green here. AM radio, it's low frequency. So the waves are spread further apart. Here's the radio waves. Those radio waves are diffracting when they go over the hill. They diffract, they spread out when they go over the hill. And clearly, the AM radio waves diffracted enough for me to be able to detect them in my apartment. That makes sense? They spread out enough for me to get them at the bottom of the hill. I was able to hear AM radio. But FM, high frequency megahertz, now we're talking about waves that are closer together here. Using red and green just to take you back a few couple weeks to Christmas. FM radio waves, high frequency, close together, they spread out as well. But look what happens to them as they spread out. They spread out to the point when over here at the other side of town, my car can detect them, but they don't spread out enough to be detected at my apartment. So because low frequency diffracts more, I was able to hear AM radio in my apartment, but I, but I wasn't able to hear FM radio in my apartment. Does that make sense? Let's go back to this page. The frequency of the wave, as the frequency is lower, I'm going to put here in brackets, example, AM radio. If you want to use the way that I remember this still to this day, if you want to use that, then the example would be AM radio. As the frequency goes down, the amount of diffraction increases. So as I used AM radio waves in my apartment, I was able to hear my station. But when I used FM radio waves in my apartment, I wasn't able to detect my station. Does that make sense? Low frequency waves, more diffraction. High frequency waves, less diffraction. OK. Now, here's the last thing, and this is what's going to tie together what we just did, this diffraction thing, with what we did just a few minutes ago, the interference thing. And that's that picture that I showed you a couple minutes ago and that you have on your hand right here. Here we've got diffraction taking place through two openings. So you got a wave here. Maybe it's a water wave. Maybe it's a radio wave. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. you got a wave that's approaching this boundary. Most of it's reflecting, but in two spots, it's going through. And as it goes through, it diffracts. But because it's diffracting in two places, the diffracted wave, look at, look at the wave right here. Okay, this is the diffracted wave from the second hole. But this is the diffracted wave from the first hole. And at some point... Those two waves hit each other. And when two waves hit each other, what do we get? Constructive or destructive interference. 
All right. I'm going to look at, I want you to look at the bolded lines here. And you can see, I think, quite clearly which ones are the bolded lines and which ones are the thinner lines, the thick lines and the thin lines. The thick lines are going to represent crests, and the thin lines are going to represent troughs. Okay, you got it? So this is going to be a crest. This is going to be a trough. What I want to do right now, what I want you to do right now, and what I'll do with you here, is go through this diagram and take a look at wherever we have two thick lines crossing each other or two thin lines crossing each other. What do we get when we get two thick lines crossing each other? Two crests encountering each other. That would be constructive interference. What do we get when we get two troughs uh, hitting each other? That would be constructive interference. So wherever you get two thick lines or two thin lines, crossing that's constructive interference we're going to make i'm going to make that red now you can use x's whatever you want but i want you to remember that the next thing you're going to do is destructive interference either use a different color or a different pattern so that you can tell the difference here i'm going to put a little red dot wherever we have constructive interference okay go through everywhere where it's thick and thick or thin and thin not right here okay look at this one Thick and thin, that's destructive interference. We don't want that. Just thick and thick, thin and thin. I'm just going through all those spots right now, trying to figure out everywhere where I get constructive interference right now. Looks like a lot of spots here. All right, well, now I'm going to take green in the spirit of Christmas. I'm going to put green dots wherever we have a crest and a trough hitting each other or destructive interference. You can use a different color or you can use, if you used X's for constructive, use dots for destructive or or some other patterns so that you can tell the difference here. Okay, thick and thin. Should start seeing a pattern after a while here. Everywhere where a thick line crosses a thin line, a crest crosses a trough, we have destructive interference. It's like the Christmas lights on the side of somebody's house. Start joining dots together. Let's go through a little kindergarten work now. Connect the dots. We connect the dots. We see these lines forming. These alternating lines of constructive and destructive interference. We call the red ones antinodal lines. And we call the green ones nodal lines. The red ones would be areas of constructive interference and the green ones would be areas of destructive interference. Picture this as a water wave. Okay, a water wave coming through two openings. Say Logan is on an air mattress in this pool or lake trying to read a book. Say Mary is on an air mattress in this pool or lake and is also trying to read a book. Logan is going to be right here on his air mattress. Mary is going to be right here on her air mattress. What happens to Logan? 
Logan is bobbing up and down on his air mattress like crazy. He can't read his book because he's doing it's all he can do to hold on to the air mattress and not fall off. Why? Because it's an area of constructive interference. We get big crests and big troughs, twice as big as the original crests and troughs were because it's constructive interference. What's happening to Mary over here? She's just laying on her air mattress, leisurely reading her book. Because everywhere along this green line right here, we have destructive interference the waves have canceled out. So right here, it's calm water, right? Calm water. Right beside it, we have a line of turbulent water or big waves, big crests and big troughs. And then right beside that, calm water. And then right beside that, big crests and big troughs. Does that make sense? These alternating areas of constructive and destructive interference.